Hey folks, Joseph Sapporo here. We're still in October since it's Halloween month. And I already reviewed both the Rocky Horror Picture Show along with their equal shock treatments. I mean, it brought into the table here. And since I just mentioned it on two of my reviews, well, I'm finally going to do it right now. The Rock Musical Horror Comedy by Brian De Palma, who wrote and directed it. Phantom of the Paradise. Yeah, basically it's a rock musical parody of The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston LaRoxy, along with a mixture of Faust by uh, Christopher Marlowe and Goffe, and the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. And as you can see, that's Wayne Finley right there playing the Phantom. He also played uh, another role, which apparently that's him anyway. Uh, Winslow Leach, who's a singer-songwriter, who wants to apparently be able to sell his music, or in some cases want to be able to play. But at that point on, he sold his soul for rock and roll to this record producer and a trumpeteer. I don't know if I said that right, uh, Andre Bonier, named Swan, who was played by Paul Williams. But not only that, but he wanted to actually write his music for his love interest, Phoenix, who was played by Jessica Harper. This is the old VHS tape that, believe it or not, my family had this since 1994, which would have been its 20th anniversary at the time. It's a very old VHS tape. It's actually from CBS Fox video. You see the back here with uh, a screenshot of both Paul Williams and William Finley as the Phantom. And you can see a screenshot of uh, what's supposed to be yeah, Winslow Leach right there, along with the girls. <laughs> And you can definitely see all the information here and there, the synopsis and all. Yeah. And you can see the spine. <laughs> yeah. Of course, if you play the VHS tape, it, they actually contain the Fox Video logo from 1993. Or I think it was 92. Yeah, it was 92. So they didn't have the CBS Fox logo. So it had to be a reissue from 1993. Uh, anyway, we got this at Blockbuster back in 1994. Uh, after we went to go see The Lion King, uh, we went to Blockbuster so we could start you know, renting or buying VHS tapes. And this was on sale. And we watched it ever since. And this is the same tape. <laughs> That's where I first discovered this movie, because uh, my mother had saw this movie, I think when she was a little girl. Yeah, because it had to be, because she was about 10 years old. It's, my, my mom, of course, was born in 1964, so maybe at that, or maybe it was later than that, I don't know, but I think she might have seen it as a little girl in theaters. But otherwise, um, she might have just saw it on TV. I think Select TV, perhaps. You know, because I know my father has Select TV and everything. Well, whatever the case. <laughs> um, when when I first saw the movie, I was like, "Wow!" I was a bit surprised that there actually was uh, a parody of Phantom of the Opera, because I have heard of that. And I have seen the several adaptations of of that, and yeah, there's even the Robert England version. Yeah, Robert England from the Nightmare on Elm Street films. It's a delight. I mean, it has a lot of great songs here and there, all memorable here, and um, the cast was just excellent. and And it's hard to believe this was an earlier film by Brian De Palma. 
who at this rate, this was before he went on to do films as we all know, like uh, Carrie, Dress to Kill, Scarface, Carlito's Way, Mission Impossible, yeah, the first one, that is. Um, several others that he's done in his career. Um, basically, he's always challenging the Alfred Hitchcock in his films, and I know he's done other works too that that's very similar in tone. Um, but of course, um, there is a Blu-ray already, along with the DVD that came out uh, from Shell Factory back in 2014. Uh, it's still available. They also had an Arrow release, which is overseas. But it did have a, a DVD from 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment. Uh, it was released in 2001. Um, it could still be available. Um, hopefully I'll be able to find it uh, later on if I get a chance. Uh, however, I did actually watch the movie where I found a DVD copy. I was lucky to download it and, and burn myself a copy. And I was even amazed that they got away with a PG rated film because um, it could have been closer to being R rated as possible, especially the scene where you know, Winslow got caught into the record pressing machine, you know, about to crush his entire face and was burned and all the blood could have come right out. I'm not so sure if anyone actually had seen the original cut of that, but if they did, that would have been the cause of that, for the rating system to, to trim it. And then there's even a scene where um, Arnold uh, got shot in the head, too, and blood started to come right out and through his eye. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, so... But I guess for the most part, it was pretty much PG blood. Uh, but the one that I actually watched, uh, believe it or not, was supposed to be closer to uh, the Palma's um, original vision. Uh, one YouTuber, or perhaps maybe just a person online, who actually had took um, the original footages and other stuff that, that came directly from the Blu-ray and DVD combo pack. I would love to pick that up someday, and I hope I will was that he actually uh, put in some inserts and they were going to be originally called simply Swan Song Records which is um, owned of course by record producer you know, Swan and um, which makes sense though because he has a swan himself but apparently they changed it to Def Records because of the controversy was sued by uh, Led Zeppelin and then try to add some alternate uh, footages and other scenes that didn't quite make it into the theatrical cut. Um, yeah, of course, color corrected it too to make it exactly right. Try to make it look as as crystal clear and, and having the, the sound has been restored. So it probably would have been the closest. And that's the DVD copy I have, um, which I'm glad to, to actually found it. Uh, Gotta give credit to Dr. Um, Spirestein to to actually uh, put everything together here. Um, and yeah, you'll probably be able to find it um, through his website if you can. But it's or probably have to pay for it too if you have to. But it's available. Uh, but they still have the old um, logo that they use, um, which would assume that it's supposed to be a death of, of a bird, probably a sparrow. And here's another thing I noticed too about this movie was that yes, I, I think some of the characters, or perhaps maybe just two, uh, also kind of use some of the birds' names, you know, like Swan and, and Phoenix. I mean, I'm not so sure if uh, Winslow is probably a was closer, but I felt like, wow, they really, uh, it really chirps a lot here. <laughs> okay. And I know uh, the movie, when it first came out, it, it did premiere at the National Theater in Westwood, which has now been demolished. It became um, 
and apart apartment complexes and all these restaurants and stuff, I guess. Um, it wasn't a big hit upon its release. Yeah, it was released on Halloween. Um, but apparently it got very successful in Canada uh, at uh, Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. And not only that, but they also sold uh, millions of copies of the soundtrack. And interesting enough, uh, one of the songs uh, by Paul Williams actually appeared on on the Brady Bunch Hour. Yeah, it was a an hour um, musical uh, show, which is take on the Brady Bunch, of course. Uh, then we also learned here that I couldn't believe this, but Sissy Spacek, uh, before she became an actress, uh, was the set designer for the movie, was the set dresser for the film, uh, joining in by her boyfriend, which is now her husband, Jack Fisk, um, who is the film's production designer. <laughs> so, of course, this would have been the film that pretty much would have got her her opportunity to play the title role of Carrie White, which would be the first uh, Stephen King production uh, based on his novel you know, that's adapted by De Palma himself. Yep. Which is definitely the best one we ever had, and I know I reviewed that film too. Uh, I also learned that. Um, that they actually did shot the movie at a real pressing plant, um, which was actually at a, um, a toy factory called Pressman, where they actually had to try to make it look almost like the the record pressing plant, which I know ben Finley's character got caught, and that's where it disfigured his face. Yeah, and. But they tried to uh, get him out of there as soon as possible once they tried to put the shoot on. I mean, they had to use a cast mold just to get to this particular scene. But um, they were also afraid because they came in just in time to get him out of there so he doesn't cause an injury and it won't suffer the same fate that, that you saw in the movie. Um, which and of course, uh, the electronic room, which they actually uh, had Winslow compose his katata, which is the scene where Swan re restored his voice, um, was actually at a real-life recording studio called the Record Plant. And the walls that they were covered, um, such as the knobs and everything, still stands. Um, and they also used the oversized custom-built electronic synthesizer, you know, dubbed as Tonto, you know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> okay. Um, also because uh, producer Edward um, Pressman yeah, because a long-time producer has been producing several movies here and there. He's been producing for years and decades. Um, he has to sold it to the highest bidder to 20th Century Fox so they can release it themselves as a distributor. And it's been that way for a long time. And they still own the rights to it. And, of course, it was... Just like Rocky Horror, Picture Show, and even Shock Treatment, both films got critically panned, and they were, and it didn't, and it flopped at the box office, of course. But then over the years, um, it got critical uh, revaluation, so now I have more positive reviews than ever. Got an 85% on Rotten Tomatoes, got a 7.4 on IMDb, and all. I mean, I, I, hard, I couldn't believe it myself, but I even found an old uh, Gene Sisko's uh, review of the film where he only gave it two stars, saying that this film is childish. And, uh, and uh, he, he says that it has a meaning only because it points to something else, which, which the rock music scenes is very treacherous. 
and the whole idea was a joke. Some criticism that Cisco gave. Well, but I guess that's exactly what they were trying to do, and it tried to be as as clever as he wanted it to be. Well, anyway, let's get to the review. It stars William Finley, who I know passed away in 2012, but he was a great actor. He's been in films like Sisters, which was also by Brian De Palma. He was a longtime collaborator friend of, of De Palma's and he went on to do the film with Chuck Norris uh, called uh, <laughs> Silent Rage yeah uh, Paul Williams yes uh, long time musician and I know he's done a lot of music a lot of work and other TV shows in the 70s and, and movies and stuff I mean, yeah, he wrote a lot of great songs here. I mean, in fact, he was best known for writing the song Just an Old Fashioned Love Song, which was later covered by Free Dog Nights. Yeah, you know that song. Um, yeah, he, he also uh, did some composing music for uh, the Muppet movie, too. Interesting. And he also had a cameo appearance in the film. Uh, Jessica Harper, as I already mentioned, from movies like Suspiria from 1974. Yeah, she's in the remake too. I mean, probably the best thing about it. And of course, Shock Treatment, uh, Pennies from Heaven, uh, my favorite year and, and all. Uh, very beautiful actress. In fact, this was her first film. Uh, Garrett Graham, well, I know he went on to do a lot of great films too, including the, the sequel to Child's Play. <laughs> yeah, Child's Play 2. Um, he's done a lot of great work. And I think he was also on Star Trek, too. Uh, Raymond Louise Kennedy, um, which I know he's a songwriter and musician himself, and a singer, and also a record producer in Los Angeles. Uh, George uh, Mamamoli, who happens to be a longtime friend of, interestingly enough, director Martin Scorsese. And uh, he collaborated with him uh, in a few films of his, such as Mean Streets, as well as New York, New York. But he also appeared in other films uh, like Rocky and his last film, because he passed away on May 20th, 1985, yeah, just after I was born, which was May 2nd. Um, he was in The Sure Thing. Uh, yeah, the movie that was directed by uh, Rob Reiner with stars John Cusack and Daphne Zeneca. Archie Hahn, Jeffrey Commandor, and Peter Ilblin, which, uh, which I know apparently was credited as Harold Oblong. Yeah, they happened to play um, the band called the Juicy Foods, along with the Beach Bums and the Undead. Yeah. Rod Sterling, yes, Rod Sterling, the, the narrator the producer, the actor known for The Twilight Zone, yeah, the original, along with Night Gallery. I think this was one of his last movies. And he was, because of course he's also a prey right himself. And uh, Janice uh, Bright. Um, and of course, written and directed by Brian De Palma. The movie began set in 1974. We meet a talented, gifted, sort of an outcast, but he's very brilliant, music composer and singer and songwriter, Winslow Leach, who has a wily <laughs> uh, blonde hair with glasses, was played by William Finley, who looks a little bit like Warren Zevon here. You know, the popular singer and songwriter who's no longer with us, who performed the rock song Werewolves of London. You know how that goes. Ah woo, Werewolves of London. Ah woo. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Going for that idea. Anyway, his music is being heard by a rightly acclaimed record producer and entrepreneur, aptly named Swan, who's played by Paul Williams. He's the villain of the story, 
Winslow's the hero. As Winslow plays an original composition called False, which follows a set run for a 50s style massage band titled The Juicy Fruits, yeah, named after the Rickley's chewing gum, or perhaps maybe that's what the Palma came up with cleverly. <laughs> but yes, uh, this was a band that Swan produced, uh, which at this rate would later be replaced by simply the Beach Bums, a take on the Beach Boys. Yeah, a pop band. And then later, The Undead, which is a take on a rock and roll band dedicated to horror, such as Black Sabbath, yeah, in a way. Uh, anyway, Swan believes that Winslow's music would be perfect as an opening to his highly anticipated new concert hall, The Paradise, and joins in with his right-hand man and best friend, Arnold Philbin, who's played by George Mamanali, and attempting to steal it under the guise of Winslow, thinking that he produced it, but he didn't. Because one month later, Winslow goes to Swanson's um, office and building called Def Records, which was, of course, known originally as Swanson, just to follow up about his music, but he's being kicked out by a bunch of guards that was sent by Swanson's secretary. And then later he sneaks into Swan's private mansion, which is sort of like a playhouse mansion in a way, which observes several women to rehearse his music for an audition. And one of the, the women that he meets turned out to be a beautiful, aspiring singer named, aptly named, Phoenix. And it's love interest, too, played by Jessica Harper. Yep, she has that wonderful husky voice of hers especially the way she sings that soothes and melts uh, your heart and soul <laughs> anyway Winslow deems that she would definitely be perfect and wonderful for his music and hoping that Swan's plan to open the paradise with his music will be astonishing and be excellent too hoping that this will be the opportunity for Phoenix and the rest of, of the band. But he got kicked out, you know, without his name. And this is the second time he gets kicked out. But in a response, he disguised himself as a woman, trying to sneak in, and also trying to speak to Spawn, speak to Swan, while already in a pool bed in this particular public domicile, launch pad where you get to see a bunch of ladies swarming around yeah, as the camera's watching but then of course he's being sent getting kicked out once again and now getting beaten up and now getting beaten up and with sentence uh, life sentence in Sing Sing prison for drug dealing and he incredibly framed him his teeth are being extracted and replaced by metal grills which is an experimental prisoner program to decrease infections among inmates, as Swan founded it. But six months later, Winslow heard that the Juicy Foods had made an anticipated hit, hit record of his music with Swan's backing, and that's where he became completely furious, you know, while he was already packaging all the toys, you know, to be sent by the toy manufacturer of all the boxes around, joining with all the rest of the prisoners. And he escaped to prison, going inside the toy box, uh, sending directly to the delivery truck. Um, he got out of there and was ready to rush into the Def Records building and started to destroy all the memorabilia and all of his stuff and being chased down by a bunch of guards. And then he went to the back side, which turned out to be uh, the Record Plus uh, factory, where he got caught by one guard. Um, he scared him off um, just when he was about to open the machine to, to destroy all the LPs. And then he, he slipped, then uh, caught his, um, his sleeve into the machine as it starts. And his, and his head went head first into the pressing machine and crushes him, leaving just badly, burnly, badly burned scarred into his right hand face. 
and damaged his vocal cords. And he ran as fast as he could and, and fell all the way down into the East River where the cops were ready to follow him as news press uh, had read that he was presumably dead. But actually, Winslow was not dead at all. Because now he's being the disordinary and now deformed Winslow by sneaking into the Paradise Costume Department and dons a long black cape and a silver owl-like mask and hence the title, The Phantom. So now he is becoming the Phantom of the Paradise. <laughs> he terrorizes Swan with his musicians by nearly killing the beach bums. He sent out a bomb inside the car, which of course would be leaned on by one of the musicians, uh, giving a, a photograph uh, by uh, Arnold, and also to help out one of the members by giving him speed. Yeah, it was split screen while you can see the performance of the Beach Bums. The song was called Upholstery. <laughs> uh, but then the, the car exploded. I think, it, I think it almost killed them. Maybe, maybe startled them completely. Um, and then, um, and then they were playing a heavily reworked version of Winslow's own Foss song. That was part of it. And Swan, who was all the way back into the balcony, had watched the whole thing, and it was all videotaped. So he went inside his secret room as it opens um, through the uh, the candlelight uh, lamp. And it goes directly into the secret mirror door as it opens, and then that's where he gets to watch it until he got caught by Winslow, as he already knew, yeah, the Phantom. So now the Phantom confronts Swan and offers to compose a chance to have his music produced his own way by a specifically built recording studio. Swan provides the Phantom to be connected with an electronic voice box, enable him to speak and sing with it. He was trying to synthesize it to make it match to the almost original vocal cords that he had. Uh, but unfortunately, he talks like a robotic. Uh, <laughs> like let's say if you watch Batman vs Superman, you know the way Batman had uses that voice box to sound totally robotic. You couldn't understand the word he's saying. Yeah, like a drive through uh, voice box. <laughs> yeah, for, for the drive through window, that is. Anyway, Swan asked Winslow to rewrite his katana with Phoenix in mind for the lead. And although Winslow agrees to do so, he signs a contract in blood uh, along with Swan by breaking the deal to tell Philbin that he would send Phoenix her perfection to sing um, on stage. But it only gets worse, too, when Swan actually hires a, a glam rock prima donna named Beef, who's played by Garrett Graham. So he'll be the lead of Winslow's Foss and relegated to a Phoenix to back it up. But Winslow refused that, and to make matters worse, Swan decided to actually lock up the place, joining in with his guards, while he continues to go around, you know, riding his music and playing it too and while getting them drugged in with a bunch of uh, you know drugs and pills and everything so that way he'll continue to go on um, well only worse um, the guards actually took out uh, a bunch of uh, bricks and mortar to cover up the entire door so he doesn't escape but then he later breaks through and was ready to attack um, Beef, which Beef was already performing the, the Foss, which I know he had trouble with, <laughs> but once he got into it, I mean, Swan accepted it. Uh, therefore, you know, just to get ready for the performance uh, and the start of the opening night at the Paradise, which led to basically a parody of Psycho, yeah, you know, the shower scene, it's obvious because you know, De Palma loves to <laughs> influence uh, Hitchcock here, uh, where 
the, the Phantom Master takes out a knife, he uh, stabs the, the shower curtains, and while well, already Beef is like singing the tune, and then all of a sudden he screams, and then, then a toilet plunger went into his mouth, and that's where he warns uh, Beef to not sing that tune. Only Phoenix could sing it. Anyone who tries dies. So at that rate, he had to pack his stuff up, and getting ready to Cincinnati so he can stay with his mother but unfortunately Arnold refuses him to leave and try to give him something that will cheer him up because this is exactly why he's, he's saying all this stuff that he doesn't understand so he forces him up to go perform and that's where we lead to the undead you know, performing the, the beats uh, called um, well you know Something super like you, which would lead to the Beast construction song, which will be Life at Last. And that's when the Phantom appeared all the way on top of the stage. He grabs the, the neon uh, thunder um, strike and was ready to shoot it right, right directly into Beef, just as he was performing with the guitar. And suddenly he got electrocuted. And he was fried and was taken directly to the hospital as soon as possible. And now, finally, when he gets his chance, uh, Swan offered um, Phoenix to perform you know, after uh, Beef's death. And that's exactly what Winslow wanted to have in the first place. And, you know, he actually uh, strangled the one person who had the sp holding the spotlight, and then he begins to hold it on and began going directly into Phoenix so that way she'll be able to sing her beautiful tune called Old Souls yeah so he was happy and he was just uh, feeling exactly what he was wanting in the first place but then he learned something that's completely wrong when Swan wanted to use um, Phoenix for glamour and have her you know, appearing worldwide and also to sign a contract um, for her music career trying to warn her that um, she, that Swan's going to destroy her career and even worse, kill her but she refused to listen also trying to recognize that it's actually Winslow underneath uh, that mask but um, yeah, she was frightened so therefore, she began to find out that, yes, the Phantom did kill Beef. And now um, she was being taken all the way to the mansion. And that's where Swan was with Phoenix, you know, falling in love while recording the, the song that, that she performed. And that's where the Phantom appeared on top of the roof. Shock and appalled. Winslow attempt to commit suicide by stabbing himself. Yeah, I know the Phantom. And then he was awakened by Swan on this waning night. It was already raining too when this happened. And then the, he would actually told him a message that he'll never be able to see Phoenix again now that he's under Swan's contract. Because he's also under contract too. Just as Winslow was ready to stab her, him and told him that he'll never see Phoenix again. Therefore, that's when uh, Winslow decided to rush directly into the studio, straight into the video library, and found the contract video that Swan recorded. We began to learn that there's a twist behind this character of Swan, it was that he isn't exactly who he really is. He's actually the devil in the skies. I mean, we spotted the real swan, who was actually a young uh, rock and roll uh, singer, who was ready to commit suicide because he's under drugs and everything, and he isn't exactly as young as he used to be. He's about to slash his wrist with a shaving knife until he spotted uh, his doppelganger of himself through the mirror and ask him to actually sign a contract so he'll be able to take over and now he'll become as young as he'll ever be. 
And that's what led to the next uh, recording, which happens to be for Winslow, as we saw earlier, that he actually signed in blood through the contract and under you know, Swan's uh, commission. And then the next tape, the same recording, that's where we spotted the Phoenix, who is pretty much under drugs here. You can see how she's all high. And she had to sign in blood as well. And that's where he began to find out that the entire performance, which at this rate Swan is about to hell, a wedding proposal between him and Phoenix, um, where everyone gathered around, you know, including all the dancers, you know, dressing up like swans, you know, black swans. And then he ha hired uh, Arnold to portrayed as uh, a priest so that way they'll be able to, to read their bowels well until Phoenix was going to be ready to be assassinated so now it was up to the Phantom to to not only destroy the entire studio burning all the, the videos and everything around he decided to rush to, to stop the assassinate the assassin who was ready to shoot her but then accidentally shot uh, the priest, which happens to be Arnold, and now he died. And now he was going after Swan by taking off his mask that he stole off as he swings around. And that's where he revealed, well, just like how the performance we saw in The Phantom of the Opera. And how, did he, how, his, how his face is all disconfigured might have been some makeup and stuff that he had, or maybe it could be an accident, but whatever. But he was shocked that Winslow stole the mask and was ready to strangle uh, Phoenix until the Phantom took uh, one of um, the cap of of, the, of one of the dancers and stabs him with it, only to be taken by the crowd. And then suddenly, the wound that he had is starting to come off and although maybe he might have been stabbed too again and we all we found out that yeah he's dying he took off the the owl like mask off and that's where we get to see Winslow already disconfigured you can see his eye popping out from before and that's where uh, Phoenix were incredibly shocked and very sad too that well Winslow is dying and now that led to this final conclusion where now both um, Winslow and Phoenix are by at their side yeah very sad too but it, it, it's a downbeat ending just like the Phantom of the Opera anyway um I thought Brian De Palma did a wonderful job, but uh, composer just uh, cleverly uh, took this story and blended in for a rock and roll opera, and you know just for fun. And the music itself was just incredible. I mean, everything that was composed by Paul Williams himself was the star of the film, and yeah, he he makes a, a very convincing villain right there. I mean, he, he pretty much owned everything that he does. Uh, Will Fri uh, William Friendly, on the other hand, is uh, remarkable as the hero who's trying to do what he can to actually stop um, Swans' schemes and try to do his best to save uh, his love interest. The one that he cares for the most is Phoenix was beautifully played by Jessica Harper and I love her singing voice too I mean it, it's top-notch right there and I also love her too she's just an incredible actress she's very beautiful very talented and and she's very lovely too and and to me both of them have terrific chemistry that I kinda wish they had clicked more uh, through the story but I, I know the movie had to run into 92 minutes Maybe it could have been a little bit longer if we had more of the chemistry between the two. I mean, more than Swan. Uh, 
Uh, as for the, the ban, uh, the juicy fruits, as well as the beach bums and <laughs> the undeads, I mean, they were awesome. Uh, they really uh, blended in very well with, with all the natural themes here. Uh, Garrett Graham was just hilarious as uh, Beef. It's too bad that he had to die, though. I mean, he didn't deserve this. I mean, it's not his fault that, you know, he had to be under the the, the music that uh, that Winslow had to write, you know, through Swan's, um, his Swan's uh, permission here. I mean, if anything, who could take the blame, it's Swan. And that sucks, man. And in the, the scene where he actually have uh, Winslow laughing horrifically too, I mean, like he was very proud that he killed Beef. I mean, that's that's just sad, <laughs> depressing too. But I know. Um, but anyway, they had a lot of great songs um, from the soundtrack. You know, "Goodbye Eddie," "Goodbye" was was excellent. Kind of almost sounds a little bit like uh, Elton John's. Uh, Crocodile Rock, in a way. Uh, Foss was was uh, beautiful. Um, this led to a first reprise into the last. Um, I love the song that played at the end credits called "The Hell of It." You know, of course, by Paul Williams himself. And but most of all, I do love the songs by Phoenix, and which is, of course, just the Harper playing with songs like "Old Souls" and. And, uh, what was that other song? Uh, Special to Me. Yeah, that's another great song. That was the one where she had to perform as an audition in that one scene. Uh, yeah, and, uh, Wonderful Cinematography by Larry Puzzer, um, which edited by Paul Hirsch. And the way they created that particular style, I mean, this is a 70-ish film, as we know, so you notice how different it actually composes here with the split screens and and other uh, and the close-up scenes too like when uh, Winslow goes all the way directly into the Def Records building and you can see all these uh, uh, incredible close-ups and and fast and the way it starts the all these uh, dolly shots that they put into it you know like it goes almost in a 360 spin too uh, almost kind of like how they shot it uh, with other films, like uh, the Clockwood Orange and all the other scenes where they show these, the wi those wide lens uh, close shop, uh, close ups and and like depth of feel right there too and, and all. Okay, I know I'm sorry I'm stuttering here, um, but yeah. So this is perfect, and it definitely works well for Halloween. Um, it, it actually had a double bill with the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, when it came out in the late 70s. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, both films didn't do quite as hot as, as they were hoping for. But over the years, I mean, this movie became a cult following, and it's great that it got positive reviews in later years. And what's interesting that this movie got nominated for a Cami Award and Golden Globe. And uh, I don't think it didn't win, though. I'm not so sure. I don't think so. But it could have, <laughs> because the music was just terrific. Um, but hey, you know, I'm just glad to hear that that at least it got some of the attention it deserves, because it is very subversive and, and all. I mean, Swan deserves all the blame for actually stealing his katata by uh, mutilated by all these grease balls. The setting for the movie just looks magnificent and incredible, especially uh, the scene with uh, Swan sitting onto the table that's that's the shape of an LP, and he was actually trying to find, searching for an artist that could actually perform Winslow's music very well. And there's other pieces here and there, you know, with the, the studio, how uh, naturally beautiful it looks and has a nice shade of red and or even the scene where where Swan just enters um, the secret uh, passway into his um, particular room to, to watch uh, this particular footage yeah you know the mirrors and all like every mirror has like a secret passway here because it even captures 
the evil spirit of the music industry that can definitely resonate it by today's standards, especially what's going on nowadays, you know, where every artist these days had to use auto-tune and people had to expose their bodies, you know, twerking and all, singing some crappy lyrics that's written by some other per, some other music composer or, or songwriter around that doesn't know how to fucking write for shit. I mean, and it just seems like it's more of a popularity contest than nothing at all. And and that's what we're getting nowadays with, with bad music. I mean, I miss good music. And the way they portrayed it here, it pretty much would have summed it up nowadays. So it seems like everyone's like pretty much swan. <laughs> I don't know, that's just what I thought. Anyway, but that's Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, definitely a, a great tribute to the Phantom of the Opera and all for rock and roll. And I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.